Hey friends, welcome or welcome back to my channel. This is Cruel Intentions, a true crime channel. I am Holly and with every video I take you on a journey throughout Australian true crime history. If you are interested in Australian true crime and love that I still can't figure out lighting for the life of me, then consider subscribing. Or don't. I'm not here to tell you what to do, I'm not your real mum and I never will be. Today, we're going to talk about a man known as South Australia's first serial killer, a man by the name of Johan John Balaban. He was also known as the Romanian Maniac, or, for the purposes of not letting an opportunity pass me by, the Romaniac. Johan Balaban brutally and mercilessly murdered five people in a five-year period. One of those people was his own wife. One was his mother-in-law, and one was his stepson. So, fair warning, this case will involve mention of mutilation, mental health issues, and it will also deal with the murder of a child. Just after 2am on the 12th of April 1953, residents of Guja Street in the middle of Adelaide were woken by the sound of a woman screaming. When some of the neighbours eventually came out of their homes to see what had happened, they noticed a 24-year-old woman by the name of Verna Marni unconscious on the pavement. She was covered in blood and only dressed in her nightdress. The window above her was open, the window of a first-floor apartment above the local Sunshine Cafe. Verna worked in the cafe and had been living in the sleepout of the small flat. Now, a sleepout, for those who don't know, is an additional bedroom created by either fully or partially enclosing a balcony or veranda. It was really common in Australian flats and houses, particularly in Queenslander-style houses, to have a sleepout or a sleeping porch, whether to accommodate guests or as an extra bedroom or just to increase the living space. And mostly those were made in the hotter months, which in Australia is most months, to be honest. Now, to the neighbours, it looked like she had been pushed out of the window and she'd fallen the 20 feet or over 6 metres to the pavement, hitting it so hard she'd been knocked out by the impact. One of the local residents immediately called the police and within only a few minutes, Sergeants Bert Lucas and Robert O'Doherty, led by Constable Arthur McLaren, arrived on the scene. Now, Sergeant Lucas approached the woman who had regained consciousness at that point. She turned her head when she heard the approaching footsteps and she looked at the officer. It was obvious to him that she had been hurt and not just from this fall, she had been injured badly and had blood all over her head and shoulders. He asked her if she'd been pushed out of the window or if she had fallen. She looked at the officer and told him that she had jumped. She said she had jumped to get away from him. She then begged the officer not to let him come near her. A small crowd had gathered around the small cafe on the corner of Guja and Brown Streets and someone called out to the officers that it must have been Balaban. Johan, or John Balaban, was a Romanian immigrant who had moved to Australia in 1951. His wife Thelma owned and ran the Sunshine Cafe and they, along with Thelma's six-year-old son Philip from a previous marriage and Thelma's 66-year-old mother Susan Ackland, lived above the cafe. John had been in plenty of trouble with police before and I mean plenty, but we'll get to that. Suffice to say that police knew exactly who the neighbour was talking about when they'd said it must have been Balaban. The sergeant asked Verna if it had been John Balaban who attacked her, and she said yes. Sergeant O'Doherty called for an ambulance, and Verna was rushed to hospital for urgent treatment. While Lucas and O'Doherty were busy taking care of Verna and making sure that she got in the ambulance and to the hospital, McLaren began speaking to witnesses. Some of the onlookers told him that they had seen a man running on the roof of the apartment and cafe. McLaren went in pursuit of this man. He went along Thomas Street, which ran parallel to Guja Street, and halfway down that street, he saw a man emerge from behind a car onto the footpath, walking extremely quickly. 
McLaren cornered this man and shone his torchlight in his face. This man had blood all over his face and hands. He had multiple cuts and bruises and also seemed to have dirt smeared across his forehead. As McLaren moved closer, he recognised him as Joran Balaban. He told Balaban that he wanted to question him about the girl that was lying on the footpath. Balaban had only one thing to say to McLaren. He said, quote, You had your chance. I killed my wife. I'll come with you. He went with McLaren without argument and walked back to the police car with him. He was directed to sit in the back of the vehicle, and as McLaren and Lucas went to inspect the premises, they heard him speak again. He said, there are three more upstairs. I killed them all, my wife, my mother-in-law, and a child. McLaren and Lucas left Balaban with O'Doherty and rushed back to the apartment to see if they could verify what he'd said. On the way there, they radioed for more ambulances, because if what Balaban had said was true, they were going to need them. When they got to the doors, they found them locked and they were unable to enter the cafe. When they returned to the car, O'Doherty told them that Balaban had repeated his previous statement, that there were three more upstairs, that he'd killed them all, that they had been his wife, his mother-in-law, and a child. McLaren asked Balaban if he had a key for the apartment, and he responded that he didn't have it. It was upstairs, locked inside the flat. McLaren and Lucas went back to the cafe and forced the door open. As they headed to the back of the cafe and up the stairs to the living quarters, they walked into what can only be described as a bloodbath. At the top of the stairs, they saw, lying on the floor, a heavily bloodstained claw hammer. They moved further in. In a bedroom on the west side of the apartment, they found a woman lying on the bed. Both the woman's head and the bed was covered in blood. She was barely recognisable, but they knew that it was Thelma Joyce Balaban, John's wife and the owner of the Sunshine Cafe. It was obvious to the officers that she had been horribly attacked with the hammer that they had seen earlier. She was not breathing, and the officers could tell that she had already died. There was blood splattered all over the walls and floor of the apartment and throughout the hallway. As the officers moved through it, they came into a room across the hall where they found another woman lying on her bed, one of her legs hanging off the side of it. This was Thelma's mother, Susan Jane Ackland. She too had been brutally attacked and her head and shoulders as well as the bed were also covered in blood. But she was alive. They could hear her shallow breathing and she was also moaning quietly. In the same room, there was another small bed where the officers found a child, a small boy. He had been violently attacked in the same manner as the two women. He was bleeding from the head, but he too was still breathing. It was six-year-old Philip Vincent Cadd, Thelma's son from her previous marriage. The officers, knowing that paramedics were on their way for the three victims, continued to search the house. In the sleep-out room on the veranda, it looked like a bomb had gone off. Furniture was overturned. There was shattered glass over the floor from a lamp that had been broken. There was blood smeared on the walls, the floor, and blood-stained men's clothing on the dressing table. By this time, McLaren had also radioed for the police medical officer to come to the scene. Medical officer Arthur Walter Welch arrived at about 3am and pronounced Thelma dead on the scene. Susan and Philip were taken from the apartment to the Royal Adelaide Hospital, both in critical condition. At that point, Detective Inspector Gully and Detective Sergeant William Blythe had arrived to take over the case, and McLaren, Lucas and O'Doherty went back to the city watch house. Yon John Balaban was still sitting in the police car when Gully and Blythe went to start questioning him about what had happened in the apartment that night. Gully told Balaban that he was going to be asked questions about what had happened and also warned him that he was not obliged to answer any questions if he didn't want to, 
because, of course, whatever he said would be used as evidence against him. Because John was a Romanian immigrant, his English was slightly broken, but he was asked if he had understood what the detective had just told him. Balaban answered yes, and then he added that he had killed his wife because she made him very unhappy and treated him like a slave. Gully decided that it was probably best to continue this questioning back at the station, so they drove Balaban back to Inspector Gully's office, where the questioning continued. John Balaban was again cautioned that he didn't have to answer any questions unless he wished to do so, and was once again asked if he understood. Balaban again said yes, and then added that at a park in North Adelaide, the police may find another person who had been killed, but he didn't know if the man he had attacked in the park was dead. Gully asked Balaban who he had attacked first at the Sunshine Cafe and the apartment above it. John Balaban said that he had first attacked his wife, then his mother-in-law, and when asked who had come next, Balaban said that he had not wanted to kill the child, but that he'd, quote, had to give it to him too. Gally asked him what he had used to attack them, and Balaban simply answered, the hammer. He then told Gully that after he had attacked Philip, he went into the sleepout occupied by Verna Marnie and attacked her, but that she had gotten away from him and jumped out of the window. Balaban confirmed to the inspector that all of the victims had been in bed, asleep, when he had attacked them. After he'd finished his brutal attacks on the four occupants of the house, he had gone back into his mother-in-law's bedroom and stolen money from her, and then he had left by crawling out of the bathroom window and onto the roof. He told the detectives that he passed two or three houses and then went down onto Thomas Street. He'd thought to himself that it might be possible to escape, but it was probably better if everything was found out and he'd given himself up because he knew that he had blood all over his face and hands. Gully asked John Balaban what made him do this to his own family, and Balaban told him that his wife and her mother made him very unhappy, that they both always fought against him and kept him as a slave. When asked if he'd been drinking that night, he responded yes, he'd had a few drinks. Gully then asked him point blank if he knew what he was doing when he attacked Thelma, Susan, Philip and Verna. Balaban responded that yes, he knew what he was doing. He was not drunk. He'd had no more to drink over the day than he usually did, 12 or 14 beers, which might sound like a lot, but he had said this was no more than he usually drunk, so I assume he built up a tolerance for alcohol. He stated again that he was not drunk and that he knew exactly what he was doing. Gully asked him about the man in the park that he'd mentioned earlier and Balaban said that they would probably find the man somewhere around the park. He didn't know who the man was. When asked why he'd attacked this stranger, John Balaban replied, quote, just folly. Gully and Blythe took Balaban to the park that he'd mentioned and made a search for this unknown man, but no one was found. On the way back, they stopped at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. Gully went in and left Blythe with Balaban. When he returned to the police car, Gully asked Balaban if he'd ever been in a mental institution, and Balaban said that he hadn't. He always knew what to do. He added, quote, It is better you die than go to a mental hospital. Gully informed Balaban that he had just spoken to a now coherent Verna Marnie. Balaban asked if Verna would die, and Gully replied that right now he didn't know. John Balaban said that it would be better if she did, and when asked why, he said that Verna had been stealing money from the shop, and that if she died, she wouldn't be able to steal from anyone else. Gully and Blythe took John Balaban back to the detective's office. Verna, Audrey, Mary, Marnie had been awake when Gully had entered her hospital room to get a statement from her. Verna was 24 years old and had worked at the Sunshine Cafe for about a year and a half. She had been employed by Mrs Thelma Balaban, but at the time she'd known her as Thelma Cad. She had known John Balaban for about a year, since well before he had married Thelma, 
He'd been a regular at the cafe. He'd come in for lunch one day in the second half of 1952, and Thelma had seen him and thought him very handsome. They had struck up a conversation, and not long after, they'd been married. He had taken on the role of husband to Thelma, son to Susan Ackland, and stepfather to Thelma's young son, Philip. She knew that Thelma and John had had a rough marriage. John had previously left to live elsewhere, but had since returned to live with his wife and her family above the cafe. On the morning of April 11th, 1953, Verna had been working in the kitchen of the cafe preparing rabbits. She had seen John Balaban leave at about 11am, and she wouldn't see him again until he woke her up the next morning at about 1.30, attacking her with a hammer. She worked that Saturday until about 1.30pm, and she returned to the cafe at 11pm that night. Her mother, incidentally, had also worked in the cafe, and she helped her and Susan Ackland clean the shop that night. She saw Thelma Balaban arrive home and watched her go upstairs to bed, and at about 12.30am on Sunday the 12th of April, her mother left to go home. Verna and Susan Ackland closed up the shop and headed upstairs to bed. She said goodnight to Mrs. Ackland when they got to her bedroom. Verna noticed little Philip already asleep in the bedroom that he shared with Thelma's mother. She went through to the sleep out, got undressed, and got into bed. The next thing she remembered was being woken up by noises, and she opened her eyes to see John Balaban standing in her doorway with a bloody hammer in his hand. He came at her then. He started hitting her in the head with the hammer. She raised her arms and hands, trying as best as she could to cover her head and deflect the blows that he was trying to land. She jumped up and crawled to the edge of the bed, and he spoke to her then. He said, I've just killed my wife. Do you want to see her? Verna shakily replied, no. John Balaban said, just a moment. Somebody is still alive inside. I'm going inside to see who it is. He left the sleep out and Verna could hear a gurgling sound coming from inside the apartment. She leapt up and rushed to lock the sleep out doors so that Balaban couldn't get back in and she squeezed herself out of the small window and let herself fall to the pavement. As she fell, she screamed out for help. Verna told Gully that John Balaban did not seem drunk or out of it from the way he was speaking to her. He seemed perfectly calm and normal. Except, of course, he was talking about how he'd just killed his wife and he'd just finished attacking her with a blood-stained hammer. Verna had been knocked unconscious by the fall, but had come to within minutes. One of her neighbours, Pamela Newnham, had seen her fall from the window and had been the one to call for police and an ambulance. Pamela had rushed over to Verna and, with the help of other residents, had covered the woman who was only wearing a nightdress with thick coats to keep her warm. The neighbours had looked up to see John Balaban peering over the roof looking down at them, but their attention was focused on Verna, who was badly injured, bleeding, and had just fallen 20 feet from a window. Verna said to Pamela as she lay immobile on the footpath, I had to jump, Pam. If I didn't, he would have killed me. I have at least lived so long to tell, so they will get him now. Pamela asked who had done this, and Verna told her it was John Balaban, and also told her to get inside, to get to the others, because he had attacked them as well. Pamela continued to watch the scene as officers arrived, and saw them bring Balaban out from behind the street. She told Verna that the police had found him. Pamela rode with Verna to the hospital, and Verna said to her on the way that at least they had him now, and that he can't get away. Back at the detective's office, Mr. Pyer, a Romanian interpreter, had been called in to assist with the questioning. Police wanted to make sure that any charges they laid and any subsequent conviction of John Balaban was not tarnished by him claiming that he didn't understand the questions or his rights. The detectives explained to Pyle that John Balaban had already admitted to attacking and killing his wife and attacking his mother-in-law 
his stepson and a young female employee of the cafe, all three of whom were in severe critical conditions. Balaban told the detectives and the interpreter that he could understand English, but the detectives wanted the interpreter to relay the information they had just been through to ensure that Balaban was certain that he had given the correct answers and that he could sign his written statement. Balaban confirmed through the interpreter most of the answers he had previously given, but added that he had also drunk an entire bottle of whiskey that night and now told them through the interpreter that he was drunk. Through the same interpreter, they got more information as to how the attacks had happened. Balaban relayed that his wife was asleep when he had attacked her, but that his mother-in-law, Susan Acklin, had woken up during that attack to see what was going on, but that she hadn't made it out of her bedroom. He told the detectives that as he was assaulting Susan Ackland, Philip had woken up and he had started to cry. He had gotten out of bed and was crying out for his mother. Balaban said that he had attacked Philip because he did not want the boy making any noise and alerting the neighbours. He told the officers through the interpreter that he decided to attack Verna Marnie as well because she had stolen from the cafe and because she had always sided with his wife and that she got what she deserved. He told them that after he had attacked Verna, he could hear noises coming from inside the apartment and so he went back and attacked all three of them again just to make sure that they died quickly. He also confirmed that he struck each of his four victims multiple times. When they went back through the questions regarding Balaban ever spending time in a mental institution, he changed his answer. He told them that he had been treated in Cluj in Romania when he was 23 years old, simply because he, quote, just got mentally unbalanced. The detectives asked him if he ever divulged that information when he applied as a migrant to Australia, and Balaban told them that he hadn't because the question had never been asked. Detectives then moved to, on to his relationship with his wife. They asked him if he and Thelma had enjoyed a normal marriage. Balaban said no, that they only lived together for a short while, but that she had made him very miserable. When asked how and why, he said he didn't know, but that she had always tried to make his life hard. He did confess that they had been separated for some time, but that he had recently gone back to live with her. He said he attacked his mother-in-law because she had made trouble for Thelma and her previous husband, and he knew that she would do the same thing with them, that she always interfered. The detectives took Balaban along with his interpreter back to the Sunshine Cafe and apartment, where they had Balaban show them exactly how the attacks happened. They also collected the clothing that he had been wearing that night, the blood-stained suit jacket, shirt and tie that he had removed before he had escaped the apartment out of the bathroom window. After police were satisfied that John Balaban had told them everything about the gruesome attacks of his own family and Verna, they took him back to the city watch house and they sat him back in the detective inspector's office. Once they were back there, John Balaban was charged with murder. He was searched and he was placed in the cells at the watch house. The detectives wanted to know how Balaban had spent the day prior to the attacks to see if there was anything that could explain why he had done what he did to his family and to the young woman and the events leading up to the attacks. Balaban told the detectives that on the 11th of April he had woken up late. He had left the Sunshine Cafe at about 11 and had gone to the hotel to drink. He was heavily intoxicated by the time he had left and he decided that he would walk along the Torrens River in Adelaide. He told the detectives that he wasn't exactly sure what had happened after that and couldn't be clear on the exact sequence of events, but through witness statements and some of John Balaban's own recollection, they were able to piece together his movements. 
A man named Patrick John Slattery was attacked by Balaban in the early afternoon, and he was beaten so badly that he wasn't able to remember the afternoon or evening of April 11th, and he couldn't remember the couple of days afterwards. He just remembered waking up on April 13th in the hospital with an injured right eye, a fractured skull, and every single bone in his face fractured. Balaban had then come upon a public toilet block. He went into the female restrooms and he found a woman there, who he attacked with his bare hands. She managed to escape and he fled. He then made his way to the university bridge, and as he was walking by it, he found an iron bar, which he picked up and put in his pocket. He kept walking, he saw a man sleeping on the ground behind the Adelaide Oval, a massive sporting complex, and unprompted he began to attack the man, striking him several times with the iron bar. He had moved on and had walked past a couple in a park. He sat and drank with them for a while before suddenly attacking the man and then running from the scene. As he passed the local tennis courts nearby, a man who had heard the cries of distress from the couple started to chase him, but Balaban had stopped and hit the man in the face with the iron bar. He abandoned the iron bar in the park, but that was not yet the end of his attacks before he would go home to kill his wife. A shop assistant, Dorothy Rowan, told the police that Balaban had come into the convenience store that she was working in. He had seen her and just began hitting her violently in the head with his fists, about seven times in all, before grabbing her throat and trying to kiss her. She struggled and resisted, and in fear of being caught, Balaban once again fled the scene. Detectives asked him whether he thought he had killed any of these people, and Balaban had said that he didn't know, but that they were all hurt very badly. He thought he may have killed one of them, at least the man in the park that he had mentioned earlier, believed now to be Patrick John Slattery, who survived but only barely and with major injuries to his head. Exhausted from his afternoon of extreme violence and unprovoked attacks, he headed back to the Sunshine Cafe. He told detectives that he went home and looked at himself in the mirror. He was sweaty, he was dirty, his face and clothes were splattered with blood. He told police, quote, I decided in an instant to kill my wife because she was the cause of my condition and of me fighting that night. John Balaban had gone on a vicious and brutal spree of violence that day that would end in the deaths of three people. Thelma Joyce Balaban's post-mortem would show that she had died of multiple heavy wounds to the skull, face and lower jaw, which had caused disintegration of the brain. Susan Ackland would survive for only 14 hours after detectives had found her. She died at 4.15pm on the 12th of April from multiple lacerations to the head and face and compound fractures of the skull. Six-year-old Philip Cadd was admitted to hospital with a fractured skull and intercerebral injuries. The blows to his head had been particularly violent. He was in a coma and doctors had to wait almost 17 hours until blood transfusions made it possible to operate. Doctors would end up removing several shattered pieces of bone and dead tissue from his brain. His condition was still critical, but doctors were hopeful that it would improve. Sadly, on Monday the 20th of April, Philip's condition began to deteriorate. Philip would only live another three days and would die at 5.35am on Thursday the 23rd of April. Verna Marnie survived her ordeal. She came close to being another one of John Balaban's numerous murder victims. She suffered severe back and head injuries, but had saved her own life by jumping out of the small window to the pavement below. While John Balaban was sitting in his cell, the detectives were discussing one last thing they wanted to speak with him about before they went home and got some sleep, if they could sleep after seeing the horrific scene they had witnessed that morning. So, I mentioned earlier that the detectives and police officers knew John Balaban well, very well actually. 
The reason they knew about Balaban was because of a young woman named Zora Kusich. Zora Kusich was a 29-year-old woman that had been murdered four months earlier. Her body had been found on the 5th of December 1952 by her boyfriend Ivan Nankinsev. Ivan had arranged to meet with Zora earlier that afternoon, but when she hadn't shown up, he spent hours searching local bars and hotels. At around 6.30pm, he decided to give up on looking for her and headed back to the small tin shack that they shared together. He found her dead and cold on the bed. The sheets around her were covered in blood. She had been strangled. Her throat had been slashed multiple times and so deeply that she was almost completely decapitated and her body had been mutilated by stab wounds and cuts. She was almost completely naked with her clothing that lay around her body shredded to ribbons. In what was described as a bowl of bloody water next to her was a small pocket knife, the weapon believed to have killed her. After speaking with witnesses that had seen him with Zora that night, John Balaban was arrested a couple of days after Zora's body was found, and he was charged with, you guessed it, murder. But this was the early 50s. There was no DNA evidence, no eyewitnesses that saw him inside her residence, and no one saw him leave. A taxi driver recalled having them both in the taxi on the afternoon before the 5th of December, leaving a restaurant on Hinley Street. He had been there having drinks with friends and he had left with her in that taxi within an hour of the time of death that had been approximated by the medical officers and pathologist. He had denied killing Zora at the time and had given an alibi about purchasing beer from a hotel, but it couldn't be confirmed. After a five-day committal hearing, police were forced to release Balaban due to lack of evidence, but they were almost certain that it had been him. Releasing John Balaban was coming back to haunt them, because now, four months later, he had killed another three people and was sitting in the cells of the watch house. It had now been over two hours since Blythe and Gully had brought Balaban into the station. They went back in and began to ask questions about the Kusich murder four months previously. The detectives once again warned Balaban that he didn't have to say anything, but that if he did, anything he said would be used in evidence. They were once again joined by the Romanian interpreter, and they asked Balaban directly if he killed Zora Kusich. Balaban said, yes. Gully and Blythe were surprised at the outright admission. They warned Balaban again just to be safe and reminded him that he had previously denied killing her and asked him again if he had murdered her. Balaban again responded with yes. Blythe asked him how he had killed her. Balaban told the detectives that he had strangled her and then cut her throat and her stomach with a red pocket knife that he had found on her table. He'd put the knife in a bowl that was in the room. He told detectives he'd washed his hands in this bowl, but when they asked where he'd gotten the water, he told them that it wasn't water. It was urine. He'd used the bowl to pee in beforehand and had washed the knife and his hands in it afterwards. I mean, if this guy wasn't shitty enough. It had happened at about half past four in the afternoon, about 10 or 20 minutes after the taxi had arrived at her home. The detectives asked why he had killed her. He told them that he'd met her at the Royal Admiral Hotel and that after a few drinks, they had decided to leave together. He said that Zora had given the taxi driver her address and that on the way to her home, she told him that she was a sex worker. He said he killed her because, quote, she was a very ordinary prostitute. Apparently finding out that she was a woman of the night had enraged him, but instead of just getting out of the cab, he continued to go with her to her home. The detectives, knowing that Zora was undressed when she was found, asked if he had taken off her clothes. He told them that she had undressed herself. Instead of sleeping with her, Balaban had found the knife and savagely attacked her. They asked him again what had made him murder Zora Kusich, and he said again that she was a prostitute and that he was very much against them. 
The detectives asked how much she had asked for, and he said five pounds. He then said that he'd actually been prepared to give her money, maybe two or three pounds, but the way she had asked had angered him. After he had murdered Zora, he said that he went to the Southern Cross Hotel because he felt like another couple of beers. So, first he says he's very much against sex workers, and then he says that he was prepared to pay her for sex, and then kills her because apparently, according to him, she was a very ordinary sex worker. Like, what the fuck, John? Now, before Blythe and Gully wrapped up the questioning and interview, they wanted to ask one last question. John Balaban had now admitted to attempting to murder Susan, Philip and Verna, admitted to killing his own wife, and now killing Zora Kusich four months earlier. They asked John Balaban if he had done this before, if there were any other murders that he had committed before he had killed Zora. Balaban, with no remorse in his voice and seemingly no hesitation, said that there was another woman, that he had strangled a woman with his hands in France in 1948, three years before he had even moved to Australia. The detectives told John Balaban that he was being charged with the murder of Zora Kusich and of his wife, Thelma Joyce Balaban. They told him that he may also be charged for other murders if Susan, Philip and Verna died in the hospital. Balaban said that he wanted the proceedings from here to be as short as possible and that he would be pleading guilty. What a guy. Balaban was remanded and a committal hearing was set for early May. On the 5th of May 1953, John Balaban faced his second committal hearing for murder in under five months but this time he had confessed. With his confession to both Zora Kusich's murder and the murders of Thelma Balaban, Susan Ackland and Philip Cadd, Susan and Philip both having succumbed to their injuries, plus testimony and evidence from Verna Marnie, eyewitness accounts of Balaban the night that he'd killed his family, his clothing and numerous other pieces of evidence, there was no way that Balaban was going to escape being committed for trial. Although he did retract his confession of the murder in France, he denied that this had ever occurred and only ever told the police it had, quote, just for something to say. I mean, like, duh, if you're stuck for words, just confess to murder. His murder trial was scheduled for the Supreme Court for the 22nd of July, but prosecutors and detectives wanted to make sure that he didn't get away with murder again. They separated the trials, and with Zora's murder occurring first, they decided to try him for her murder, separate to the murders of his family. If something were to happen and they weren't able to secure a conviction or he appealed and won, they would still be able to try him for the three murders committed on the morning of April 12th, 1953. Either way, they weren't going to let him slip through the cracks like he had five months ago. In the first days of the trial, the prosecution went through the series of events that had led to John Balaban's arrest and subsequent charge. Now, although this trial was not regarding the murders of his family, they were used as evidence against his violent nature by the prosecution and used by the defence to point to his unbalanced mental state. John Balaban, two days into the trial, gave an unsworn statement to the court. He started by describing his life before he immigrated to Australia. He was born in Nabib, Romania on the 13th of April 1924. His father was an alcoholic and his mother ended up leaving when Balaban was still very young due to the abuse and cruelty from his father. After that had happened, his father took his own life by hanging himself. After high school, Balaban entered into a technical college and studied chemistry and metallurgy, which is a branch of materials science. It studies the physical and chemical behaviour of metals. He was intelligent and a good student, but he was quick-tempered and prone to outbursts of anger. It was in 1944 that Balaban began to become very interested in philosophy. He read numerous philosophical books, and he had come to the conclusion that there was no God. It was after he had decided that God didn't exist that he had a vision. 
his ceiling opened up and a bright light shone through it. Balaban said that God, who appeared to him as an old man with grey hair and a long beard, smiled down on him and told him, quote, It is all right if you don't believe in me anymore. You do anything your conscience dictates to you and you will be happy. Balaban insisted that this was no dream, that God had really come to him and spoken to him and that after this, he knew that he could do anything he wanted and he was no longer scared of the law. In May of 1946, Balaban stated that he was in a fight with communists and he became mentally unbalanced and depressed. He said he believed that he'd injured these men quite badly and that's when he was treated in the mental hospital in Cluj. When he was released, he completed his university engineering degree and was classed as an assistant engineer in physics and metallurgy. In January of 1947, he began serving in the Romanian army, but nine months later, in October of the same year, he went AWOL and escaped to France. While he was living in Paris, at the end of February 1948, he met a Hungarian woman named Riva Klaas. He stated that he was suffering from depression again, and he had gone back to Riva's room to make love to her. He said, quote, After about an hour, I became furious with her, and I felt very powerful and strong, and I put my hands around her neck and strangled her. I did not have any intention of killing her, but I had the feeling that I had to. He fled Reva's residence, and she was found dead, naked, in her own home. The case went cold in France as police were unable to find any evidence pointing to who had killed her. Balaban went on to explain how he had moved to Australia on the 11th of July 1951. Even on the way to the country, he had a fight with the migration officer and was locked in the cells on the ship that had brought him here. As Balaban settled in the country, he had many different jobs. He worked as a fruit picker, a refrigerator technician, and as a laboratory tester, but was employed most recently as an industrial chemist. In 1952, he met Thelma Joyce Cadd in the Sunshine Cafe while he was having lunch. Their relationship moved quickly, and they were married on the 20th of September of that year. He moved into the small apartment above the cafe with Thelma, her mother, and her young son, Philip. According to Balaban, it didn't take long for Thelma to start complaining to him and about him. He told the court that he was always trying to please her, but that she started fights with him. Admittedly, he had left his job after they were married, so she was working to provide for both of them. He said that his mother-in-law was always interfering in their affairs, and he argued frequently with her as well. It only took two and a half months before Balaban decided to leave the apartment. He and Thelma stayed married, but he went to live elsewhere to avoid the constant fighting, arguing, and, in his words, the constant complaints from his wife. He left on the 3rd of December, 1952, two days before he would murder and mutilate Zora Kusich. He had met her at the hotel, gone back to her shack with her, and when she'd asked him for money to sleep with her, bearing in mind this was John Balaban's testimony and can't be corroborated, so no one knows if this is actually the case. He became disgusted and began to strangle her. He said, quote, I took the knife off the dressing table and cut her throat. I did not feel sorry for killing Kusich, and I think I was quite justified in doing so, because anybody could tell me that she was a low woman and deserved to die. Like, what a piece of shit. For the next two months, Balaban was caught up in the murder investigation. Witnesses had placed him with Kusich the night of her murder, and the taxi driver that had taken him to her residence had also come forward and said that he had driven her and a man resembling Balaban home that night. Balaban was arrested and questioned for over five hours. He lied about where he'd been that day and evening and also gave a faked alibi for the time of the murder. He had his committal hearing in late January of 1953 and was released due to lack of evidence. On the 23rd of February of that year, after he'd escaped any punishment for Zora's murder, he went back to his family and moved back into the apartment above the cafe with his wife, 
stepson and mother-in-law. He told the court in this statement that returning to live with his family didn't improve his relationship with Thelma. I mean, I wonder if that's because you were just having a hearing for a brutal murder and witnesses saw you with the victim and you were prone to violent outbursts and were in general a dick. It was only six weeks later that John Balaban began a violent and brutal rampage that started with beating a stranger so severely that he woke up in hospital two days later and ended with the vicious murders of three people and the attempted murder of a fourth. When asked why he had attacked strangers the day before he murdered his family, he said that he just hated the thought of people happily dating and that he was disgusted by men and women being together in public. Balaban's statement went on for almost an hour. He would often speak so quietly that he was almost whispering, and several times he used the phrase, I'm not afraid to die. The last thing John Balaban said in his unsworn statement to the court was, quote, I only killed those at the Sunshine Cafe because they deserved to be killed. While awaiting the trial, Balaban had been examined by several mental health and psychiatric experts. His lawyer, V.R. Milhouse, had tried to use insanity as a defence to explain Balaban's actions. He told the court that he would provide evidence to show that at the time of Zora Kusich's murder, John Balaban was suffering from paranoia and schizophrenia and he didn't know what he was doing and that he could not be held responsible in law because at the time he was legally insane. On the fourth day of the trial, Milhouse called psychiatrist Dr. H. M. Southwood, who had examined Balaban on behalf of the defence. Southwood told the court that he had found evidence of persecutory hallucinations. He had formed the impression that Balaban was suffering from a mental disorder, which he had diagnosed as the paranoid form of schizophrenia. Southwood said that Balaban had been very frank with him about his mental condition. He told the court that he had considered factors such as Balaban's lack of emotion and remorse when discussing the murders. He said, quote, He discussed the rights and wrongs of these horrible events as if it were merely a scene in a play or something quite removed from his personal feelings. Such was typical of a schizophrenic attitude. Southwood said that Balaban did not give him the impression of a sane person attempting to pose as insane. Balaban believed that at the time, when he was cutting the throat of Zora Kusich, that what he was doing was right. Southwood went on to say that he did know that he was killing the woman, and that immediately before and after the murder, that he knew it was wrong and against the law, and that he would get in trouble if he was caught. But during the actual act of taking her life, he did not know these things. He also added that he would not expect someone with this condition to ever recover from it. The superintendent of the Government Mental Institution South Australia, Dr H. M. Birch, was called as a witness for the prosecution. He had examined Balaban not only in the weeks leading up to this trial, but also in mid-December of the previous year after he was originally charged with Zora Kusich's murder. Birch had specialised in psychiatry since 1928, and he had seen Balaban on six separate occasions since the murder had occurred. He absolutely could not agree with Dr Southwood and refused to certify Balaban as insane. He told the court and jury that Balaban came within the category described by most psychiatrists as a psychopathic personality, but that he did not suffer from paranoid schizophrenia. Birch said that when he had interviewed Balaban after the murders of his family members, that he did show signs of remorse about killing six-year-old Philip. Balaban had told him that he had killed his wife because she made too much misery in his life, but added that he did love her. When Birch had asked why he had killed the little boy, Balaban had said that he hadn't wanted to, but that Philip had made a noise, and that all of his life Philip would be under a shadow from the murder of his mother and grandmother. Birch went on to say that a psychopathic personality could best be described 
as someone who was not insane, mentally disordered or deficient, but who on account of an abnormality of personality or character had been unwilling or unable to conform to the ordinary standards of society. Balaban's abnormality would be characterised by episodic, transient and explosive violent actions. Birch said that from all the evidence from all of Balaban's crimes, he had formed the opinion that there was a sexual basis permeating a good deal of Balaban's life, which included but weren't limited to the murders of at least two of his victims, Reva Kvass and Zora Kusic. He concluded by saying that over all the sessions that he had completed with Balaban, there was nothing to indicate that Johan Balaban would not have known the nature of his act or that it was wrong. He could not find any evidence of any mental disorder. The jury did not need long. John Balaban was found guilty for the murder of Zora Kusic, and he was sentenced to death. John Balaban's execution was scheduled for the 26th of August 1953, less than a month after he was found guilty. Balaban, after being sentenced and taken to his jail cell, spent the next week or so preparing, of course, an appeal. The testimony from Dr Southwood had put the idea in his head that he could get out of his sentence by appealing on the grounds of insanity. Balaban appealed to the South Australian Full Court on five grounds. 1. That he had no intention of harming Zora Kusic in any way when he had gone with her to her room. The act of killing her was done on the spur of the moment and because of a mental reaction provoked by the family he had left a few days before. 2. That he had been previously afraid to disclose the, to Dr Birch his reactions prior to and at the time of the tragedy, but if given an opportunity, he would be glad to give the doctor further history. 3 that he was previously in a mental asylum in Romania and in France for convalescence after a nervous breakdown. 4. That the principal witness, Verna Mani, was not called at the trial to give evidence of the mental strains that he had been subjected to by his own family. Like, I'm sorry, sidebar. Did he really think that Verna was going to talk about how hard Balaban had it at home, the poor thing? And five, that the summing up of the learned trial judge was not sufficient in that the jury were not directed as to the true meaning of the word wrong. While Balaban sat in his cell waiting for the outcome of this bogus appeal, he was sent a questionnaire from the French Sûreté, or the French National Police. He had confessed again in his trial to killing Riva Kvass in 1948, and the crime in Paris was still open and had been classed as a cold case. He filled out the questionnaire and recalled street names, house numbers and events that supported his confession. The French police subsequently decided that any further investigation into the Kvass murder was unnecessary because Balaban had already been sentenced to death. Interestingly though, in theory, the case was never closed because there was never a charge or conviction in France. In what could only be described, in my opinion, as a final attempt to prove that he really was mentally unstable, Balaban started to tell anyone who would listen that he was not born at the right time, that he was a great man but was misunderstood. He would boast that he was like a modern Napoleon or Caesar. He said, quote, My poor Thelma was my Empress Josephine. It's a pity she had to die. Caesar, too, held the power of life and death, as did I. Caesar will be remembered by the world, and I, too, will be remembered by the world. The full court obviously rejected the appeal on all five grounds. They said in their rejection, We can see no objection that could be taken to the conduct of the trial, or to the direction of the learned judge. We think that Balaban had a fair trial and there was ample evidence to support the verdict of the jury. For these reasons, the application for appeal must be dismissed. And just to prove my earlier point, they also stated in their rejection that if Verna Mani had given her evidence in the ordinary way instead of a written statement that was submitted, it was highly improbable that it would have been given in a form that was favourable to the defence.
like, duh. When Balaban found out about the full court's rejection of his application for appeal, he viciously attacked one of his prison guards, punching him multiple times in the face and attempting to strangle him. He was eventually subdued and received several punches to the face in turn, and he was marched back to his cell, where his demeanour went back instantly to the calm facade that he had maintained throughout his trial and sentence. He spent his last remaining few days of life playing chess in his cell. He was playing chess the morning of the 26th of August, the day that he was hanged. At 7am he was escorted by prison guards to a room where they shaved his face and gave him a haircut. He was then led to the gallows with his black eyes and bruises visible from his altercation with guards a few days earlier. He was accompanied only by a chaplain. No family, no friends, and no witnesses came to watch him die. He died surrounded by this chaplain, some prison guards, and the executioner. Almost as final proof of his violent outbursts and proneness to anger, as the chaplain tried to comfort him moments before he was hanged, John Balaban turned to him and said, Why don't you shut up? John Balaban was buried in what was called Murderer's Row, with only the date and his initials marking the spot. Usually, the police would have to take precautions against protesters at the jail gates, whether those opposed to the death penalty, family members of the inmates, or those who believed them to be innocent. Not a single person showed up that day. Inexplicably, the following Friday in the Adelaide newspaper The Advertiser, there was an obituary placed anonymously for Johan John Balaban, which read, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. It is still unknown as to who placed it. And that, my friends, is the case of South Australia's first serial killer, Yon John Balaban, a man prone to violence and rage, a man who took the lives of five and attempted to take the lives of others for seemingly no reason at all except for his own sick sense of power. May Reva, Zora, Thelma, Susan and little Philip rest in peace. I will be back with more Australian true crime, but until then, be good. Be safe and don't murder anyone. Bye.